Hi, welcome to the Variant Edition, your first weekly video podcast show. I'm Ricky. And I'm Mike. So, today on the show, same deal as usual. I have reviews this week. What are you reviewing? I'm reviewing Spider Man at School, Spider Man Dead, and uh, Spider Man at Mask Himself. Details later. What? Wait. Uh, I don't. <laughs> All right, details later. I'm reviewing uh, Transformers, X Men Phoenix War Song, Cable Deadpool, amongst other things. You know, you and your silly titles. Silly. They're but silly. you do have the Bowen uh, Hawkeye I see here. I have the Bowen Hawkeye this week, and I have the Nova Bust this week. Does that be the silver one with the clear hair? It's like a gold. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Pretty thing. sweet. Pretty sweet. And Nick's reviewing Elephant Man, and Kevin has an interview from England. So, we're going to see that. I, I, I don't even know what the hell it is yet. M- M- Mike doesn't know what is going on even. I don't I'm don't. i paying no attention today. I'm hyped up on caffeine and crack. Anyway, here's uh, Nick with the news. Hi, I'm Nick, and this is the news for the week of Wednesday, September 6th. This past weekend, Canadian National Comic Book Expo was held in Toronto, and we have some new announcements from Marvel and DC. J.G. Jones and Jeff Johns will launch a new All-Star Batgirl at the end of next year. I guess they're going to have to wait until All-Star Batman and Robin finishes up its first arc. Terry Dodson let fans know that he is committed to a five-issue arc on the now bi-monthly Wonder Woman. Dodson stated that he may stay on longer if he is still having fun. And Johns and Ethan Van Skeever have some plans for an unannounced Green Lantern project that should see release in Spring 07, possibly involving Sinestro. Quite appropriately, Marvel announced the reformation of Alpha Flight in a new title called Omega Flight, to be written by Mike Oming with art by Scott Collins. We'll see what kind of dirt we can get Mr. Oming to dish out about the book when we see him in Baltimore. And Marvel plans to continue Astonishing X-Men after Josh Whedon and John Cassidy complete their run. Sellouts and announcements of sellouts are pretty common these days, but a quick sellout of a 20,000 copy run of the seventh print of a graphic novel? Guess fans like their bone, one volume edition, collecting all the issue of Jeff Smith's classic epic and first premiering in the summer of 2004, Diamond Comics announced that while bone one volume was back in print, it was also almost instantly sold out at their warehouse. The 3995, 1300 page collection may be available in a store near you. If not, another printing is planned. And finally, back in May, we reported on the MPAA piracy bust at the Motor City Comic Con. Officers confiscated more than 30,000 DVDs and CDs and detained 12 individuals. While no arrests were made at the time, the hammer has dropped and all warrants have been issued for all 12. Newsarama is reporting that each individual has been charged with copying audio and video recording for gain which is a felony charge that carries a maximum five-year sentence and or $250,000 fine. All of the 12 have been contacted and should report back to Michigan for arraignment. The MPAA is cooperating with the prosecutors and have been asked to examine any plea agreements. So that's it for the news. I'll see you later in the show with my new Radioactive Minute. But up next, it's Mike and Ricky with a review of the new Bowen Hawkeye statue. All right, guys, so now it's time for our toy review. And this week, we have more Bowens again. And not a complaint from over here. So we have the Hawkeye. It's limited to 2,400. It's done by Randy Bowen. And we have the Frankie Ray Nova, which is done by uh, Jim Maddox. Both really great statues. Let's start off on, on uh, Hawkeye, though. First impression. It's awesome. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, it, the musculature on it is amazing, as usual. Uh, the base is awesome. Um, you can really tell when Randy is doing the sculptures himself. I mean, all the stuff coming out of Bowen Designs is really, really nice, but when Bowen does it, he sculpts it himself, it really just pops. Yeah, when Randy Bowen does it, there's a very dramatic difference. Overall, like the paint, the attention to detail, the whole base entirely is just very detailed. The paint on it, it's got that nice metallic kind of purple blue. Yeah. It's even the attention to like the bow and arrow is yeah great. It's like a real elastic string. The mm-hmm. arrow is a separate piece. Yep. The things on the base. How Ugh. many different things are on the you base? Have Iron Man's mask. You have Cap's shield. Thor's hammer, which for some reason they decided not to paint at all. It's just kind of it. it it's all that. Uh, it's dry brushed a little bit gray, but you really got to get up close to it in the light to see a difference from the gray rock. You have Ultron's mask and what I believe is his hand. Uh, Ant-Man's helmet. Ant-Man's helmet. Who's Wonder the, Man's uh, uh, glasses. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going on on this base. Great piece. It's retailing for $175, and I definitely think it's a buy. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful piece. 
So now we'll go over to Frankie Reynova. Now, this is a piece that they had online as an exclusive, but it was a different paint variation. Was, yeah, and, there's uh, like a gold where skin is like golden. Mm -hmm. It was very nice, but this one is just a normal one. Um, Gematics, you know, who you know also does a very nice job. Yeah, yeah. Very nice job. I've never had that many qualms about his stuff. The base is like a big asteroid. Yeah, which is beautifully painted. The hair. The, oh. the clear reddish orange fire hair is just amazing. It, it really makes the piece. It makes the piece, exactly. Otherwise, she might be a little bit plain. Yeah, and the hair wraps around the asteroid. Really nice. Yeah. Really, really nice piece. Um, it's pretty basic, so I mean, there's not a lot that they could have did wrong with it. But um, they, they did nice. I mean, I even like the subtle how... Because the the hair is on the head, mm -hmm. but inside of the hair you can still see the back of her silver head. They didn't just cut her head flat, yeah. and, you know, and put the fire on it. You can actually tell she's got a head inside the clear fire hair, which is a real nice touch. Definitely another sweet piece. So, another great Bowen week. Um, thanks for tuning in. We'll have another stat review next week. Have a good one. My first review this week was X-Men Phoenix War Song. Now, I kind of have a problem with X-Men going back into the Phoenix thing every other month, because there seems to be a story involving Phoenix every other month. So, I read it anyway. I'm an X-Men fan, so whatever. I'll read it. Um, and I was actually very surprised by it. Um, definitely had um, a nice twist with Emma Frost envisioning herself killing all of the X-Men, and then you know, her turning into the Phoenix and t and destroying the entire, you know, uh, planet, burning it up and stuff. Um, great scenes, basically the entire way. The artwork was great. The story that they're starting to go with, it's only going to be a five-issue arc, so, um, you know, it's going to be a quick, nice, easy read. But what they're going with, with the whole Phoenix thing, sort of the same path, Jean Grey involved, and, and for some reason, the other Cuckoo Sisters are coming back to life in dead form. I guess, you know, it's a nice attempt because, the whole, you know, zombies are cool now. Why don't we bring them back again? We'll sell books. Zombies equal money, you know, these days, apparently. So, eh, of course I'm going to read it. I like zombies. So, um, be on the lookout for this book. It, I think it's going to have a lot of very good potential. The artwork's good. I, I don't have that much to say about it. Because I, I'm kind of waiting on the second issue to give my full opinion of it. I think it has a lot of build-up to go through and stuff. But I think as a first issue, it's definitely worth a pick-up to read. So buy it. I read the first two issues of The Elephant Men, which is a new series coming out and apparently is based off of a yearly comic that came out. I have no frame of reference from those original comics, but these two are awesome. There's something about it. There, there's a nice charm to it. It's kind of like that whole Beauty and the Beast thing where it's these monstrous, you know, people, half man, half animal, but they're just kind of living their lives, doing their thing. I don't really know where they came from or why they're in the cities and trying to socialize with people, but you can definitely see the strain that they're going through, and there's nice flashbacks with one character named Ebony, who's a elephant man, you know, who's half man, half elephant, kind of looks like a detective, has a trench coat, smokes a cigarette, talks to little girls about washing behind his ears, kind of comical, kind of weird, but he has nice flashbacks about the place where he came from. He was you know, birthed and then grown in a tube and then trained as a soldier just to kill. And they show nice scenes of him fighting like half warthog men and going into battle and just, you know, taking out villages with nice futuristic guns because it takes place in like 2240. So beyond that, it's cool. The cities and everything are very nice in this story. It's a nice, uh, it's a realistic future. It's not too out there. It looks like it could happen a little bit more light, a little bit more flashing, nothing too over the top or too extraordinary. And uh, the the art in these, are, it's quite good. There's different artists on different stories. Very awesome art. Uh, I'm not really too sure where it's going. Each of these stories seem to be like their own thing. And each comic has two stories in it, and the only two that really connected were the two stories in the second issue, which you know I, I'm hoping is going to go into more, because the second issue was a nice story between this fight between one of the hippo men and a crocodile man, and it's supposed to go back to biblical terms referring to the hippo man as uh, behemoth and the crocodile man as leviathan because in Africa during that time they were looked upon as gods. Interesting little setup. Didn't go more into it as I wanted to, but I'm hoping that issue three is going to do that. So if you're in for beautiful artwork, nice touching scenes with monstrous animal people, and a kitschy little story, Elephant Man is something for you. Spider-Man Unmasked, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number 12. 
Um, this comic is actually really great in its own little way. It's, it's uh, you know, Spider-Man is in the high school and there's an angry mob who's like, Spider-Man can't teach in our schools and we hate Spider-Man. Get him out of the school system. Blah, blah, blah. Yakety, yak, yak, yak. Um, anyway, so there's this cloud that's all around the school and no one can get by except for Mysterio. Uh, the guy who, whoever is Mysterio right now, walks right through the clouds. He's like, I think I can be of assistance because surely I can walk through this cloud of smoke because of my huge bubbly head. This is exactly what happens in the comic book. When he gets inside, he, he finds out that he's talking to another Mysterio in a brand new costume. A Mysterio version that I have never seen before. It's purple and red and looks really, really cool. And guess who it is? It's Quentin Beck. Yeah, I know, he shot himself in the head, and he should not be alive to this day, but guess what? He's alive, and he's there, and he's got a huge gaping hole in his head. And on top of that, you got Daniel Burkhart, that's right, the second Mysterio, hanging out inside the school. Uh, Spider-Man is dealing at one time with both uh, the, the new Mysterio and the Daniel uh, Burkhart Mysterio, while the Quentin Beck Mysterio is playing around with uh, this girl named Miss Arrow, who's a teacher there, and he's just kind of talking to her, and, oh, look, there's a big, huge hole in my head. That's the end of the comic. Hope I didn't ruin it for you. Uh, other than that, it's, it's the usual Mysterio tricks, you know, Spider, uh, Mary Jane gets abducted by Dracula, and he's like, I'm going to suck the blood out of your wife, and Spider-Man's like, wait a second, you know what, you go ahead. And this other guy, the principal of the school, is like, well, why aren't you helping your wife? And he's like, that's not my wife. She's a robot or, or some sort of, you know, hologram of some sort. Because guess what? They forgot to put a wedding ring on. Aha. Uh -huh. And he's like, oh, and wait, I'll just whip my cell phone and call Aunt May and uh, Mary Jane to make sure they're back in, you know, Avengers Tower. And so I don't have to worry about that sort of stuff anymore. And sure enough, they are. And he pulls the principal out of the way of an anvil just in time. That's right. All that happens on one page. Check it out. It's amazing. I'm talking really fast right now, so try to keep up. Other than that, great comic, and I think you guys should pick it up. Three Mysterious, one Spider-Man, a Principal, and a Miss Arrows. Go for it. Again, Transformers Evolutions, issue three. This book is coming out every week. Now, this is something in comics that's uncalled for. Unco comic books coming out on time. This is new, and I think I I'm going to have to get used to it again. Um, however, it's a very good book. Um, Transformers, thrown into the... Into the time of John Henry and uh, them fighting. It's basically what this issue was. It was a whole lot of setup of the Decepticons and the Autobots basically setting up their sides, getting their players onto the battlefield, and basically it ended in a way to where they were going to engage each other. So it's going to be a big, probably two issue fight. Now, John Henry has joined up with the Autobots, which isn't going to do much. He has a hammer and he's big but they're big robots so what the hell is he gonna do nothing nothing much but hey it was cool of him to join up I guess um it's a really good Transformers book it's a very fresh outlook on a great storyline that they're going with um now apparently the Decepticons are you know like getting a lot of human help um he they're talking deals with other people about, oh, well, you know, if you help us out with this, we'll give you this, and both sides will win or whatever. But, you know, the Decepticons, they're deceptive. So, there's going to be a lot going on, and uh, we'll see where it goes. I mean, now comes the big fight, issue four, so be on the lookout for it. So, Spider-Man, black, blue, and red all over. Uh, this was a great comic that shook the Marvel Comics Foundations to its very core, or at least it should have if uh, Civil War, I think it was number two, uh, had come out where Spider-Man had masked himself to be Peter Parker and the world is shaken to its very core. Uh, this is kind of like a, a different take on it. This comic was planned before Civil War came out and they put it into production anyway even though it still dealt with Spider-Man and mask himself because guess what? This one was actually a lot more meaningful I think for Spider-Man fans out there. If you are Spider-Man I think you're gonna... Spider-Man fan I think you're gonna agree with me on this. Anyway, uh, Spider-Man Black, Blue and Red all over. Peter Parker is having these reoccurring dreams about uh, all his villains on one side of the bars of this, of this prison and he's on the other side of the bars and then he can't... He doesn't realize if he's on the right side of the bars or if he's in the cage and they're outside and what's going on. So he decides to climb and it's this whole big dream sequence and he's very, very confused about what he wants to do. Well, it turns out that, you know, he makes a deal with J. Jonah Jameson, you know, I will give you, uh, you know, a story. I'm going to write it. You're going to print it in Wednesday's edition. And on Thursday, I will unmask myself for everybody to see in front of your, your uh, Daily Bugle building. 
Only when he goes, it's a bunch of people who are dressed up as Spider-Man costumes along with him, and they're all unmasking him, taking credit that they're the actual Spider-Man, kind of protecting Spider-Man's secret identity regardless. I guess if J. Jonah Jameson really paid attention to who exactly popped down uh, via the web sling, and he kept his eyes on him, the rest of them really didn't matter, because Peter Parker does eventually, you know, unmask himself, and Joe, J. Jonah Jameson is just kind of like, uh, Parker, I don't need my employees making fun of me, get up here and start taking pictures type of deal, and... It's just kind of, you know, meaningful. It's, it's, it's people of New York saying, we don't care who Spider-Man is because, you know what, according to the story, you know, everyone's a little bit of a hero and everyone should be, should be happy even though one person has Spider-Man-like abilities and I'm a cop and I'm a, I'm a butcher and I'm a grocer and I'm Aunt May, you know, that sort of thing going on. Um, great comic. I say pick it up. It's a one-shot. Go for it. All right, so I actually have a radioactive minute in this episode. Now, the reason why we don't have many is because there's not really much going on with Godzilla since he's been put on hiatus due to Final Wars. And if you've ever seen Final Wars, you have good reason. If you haven't seen it, you can see my review in our pilot first episode. So if you want to go back in time of air edition, knock yourself out. Anyway, this radioactive minute is about the awesome, awesome two-disc deluxe, uh, deluxe edition, sorry version of the original Japanese classic Gojira, put out by Classic Media. Now this DVD, it's a very nice hard case. It's kind of like the Universal Monsters DVD. No slip case, but a very nice hard book shape, folds open, and you have the original, uncut, unaltered, subtitled Japanese Gojira, and you also have the Americanized Godzilla King of the Monsters starring that lovable Raymond Burr. And being a huge Godzilla fan, especially of the first film, <clears throat> they do a very, very good job with this DVD. Get a very nice booklet filled with information on the making of the film, nice black and white photos on the inside, and just pretty much the stories and what went behind why they did Godzilla the way that they did and the effects that everybody involved in the film, such as Ashiro Honda, the director, witnessed first-hand accounts of the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that influenced this film greatly, which, you know, makes it stand out from the rest of the Godzilla films, especially the 60s and 70s when he became more of a boxing, you know, luchador wrestler superhero kind of character. This film is not like that. It's more of a... It's warnings of, you know, atomic weapons and trying to let everybody know, you know, this is what can happen when atomic energy is used for the wrong reasons, things go wrong, trying to warn everybody. And their depiction of the destruction of Tokyo in this film, very on point to similar destruction that went on during World War II and everything with Japan. Film is great. They have a very nice, clear quality of the film. It's not, uh, like, pristine, like there's still some bits and pieces of it, but then again, it's from 1944, and it's original, so it kind of, you know, keeps that charm and that flavor of the first film. So all I have to say is, as a Godzilla fan, awesome job on this movie. I would really like to see if they did any more double disc sets of Godzilla films with the American versions and the Japanese ones. They probably won't, but I'm definitely glad that they did with this DVD. And it's relatively cheap. I picked it up for $16.99. I see it priced differently other places, but it's definitely worth the buy. So longtime fans will remember that I did an advanced preview of a book called Wasteland. Issue 2 recently came out the other day, and I got a chance to talk to Anthony Johnson about what the book is about and how it came to be. Now, Anthony lives in England, and we're obviously not in England, we're in New Jersey, and we don't exactly have the budget to fly to England yet. So, um, you know, we figured if those audio podcasts can do the phone interviews, well, you know, we got webcams, so we're going to do a webcam interview. So, the quality, you know, it's not the best, but we're working on it, and, I mean, come on, he's in England, right? So, uh... You know, we figured it was better than a disembodied voice. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. This is our first video cam interview and definitely our first transatlantic interview, so thanks. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I do apologize if the picture's a bit choppy, but I am 6,000 miles away. And as you can see, it's night outside at the moment. All right, I'm going to just jump in and ask, why a book like Wasteland? Well, um, I've sp <laughs> yeah, small question. Yeah, I've I've specifically wanted to do Wasteland itself for many many years. Uh, the the post-apocalyptic genre, as it's now known, is something that's always interested me since I was quite young. Mainly because I used to have a very strong interest in environmentalism, um, but being interested in telling stories as well, obviously, you know, my interest in something like that got filtered back into, well, what kind of story could I tell about, you know, 
how uh, about the end of the world, about what would happen if sea levels rose, if polar caps melted, and so on. Um, so story-wise, it's just something that's always been in the back of my mind. And it's changed a lot, as I say in the first issue's uh, letters column, it's changed a lot since then. But that was, you know, that's the basic idea. Now, the book seems to be very centered on the environment. Uh, do you consider yourself an environmentalist? Uh, I, I used to have very strong feelings about it. I, they've abated a little as I've grown older um, for various reasons. I do, I firmly believe that anyone who thinks we're not uh, seriously destroying, you know, the only planet that we can live on um, is deluded. We, there's no doubt about it. We are absolutely killing the Earth. But, you know, uh, by the time it's dead, I will be as well. So uh, I don't care so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like the environmental issues are overwhelming to the story so far. No, no. No, that's right. And, I, and I'm not. I mean, as I said, it's you know, anything that I've taken interest in and interesting. I, I can't help but try and think, well, how can I use this in a story? It's just natural to me, and I know it is for, for most writers. So, uh, yeah, it's not something that's a big part of the story in terms of any kind of, it's not a message that I'm trying to get across. It more, it's a factor in the story. It's, uh, it's one of many things that has happened before we, you know, before we join the story in issue one. Um, and it is a driving force behind those changes, but it's not something, no, it's not a message that I'm trying to preach or uh, a point that I'm trying to make with the book necessarily. I view it more as, to be honest, to me it's more, I'm, it's more of a fact. It's going to happen. So let's have a look at uh, how it might impact the world. And I, I should point out that that's not the only thing going on. Uh, you know, if, it, if anyone thinks I've just given away the ending there, believe me, they're, they're very wrong. That's not the case. Okay. Well, it seems that with the introduction of the city and the religious aspects, the second issue, um, you know, seems to suggest a more sinister angle at work. Yeah, very much. Very much so. Um, the kind of I, politics of that uh, um, has always interested me, you know, the politics of that sort of situation. Um, and there will be a lot more politics, and there'll be a lot more to do with the city. I mean, you know, we know that uh, the survivors are obviously, they're trying to get to the city. Um, and so, you know, now we've seen some of what goes on in the city, and you'll see more of what goes on in the city until the two finally meet. And yes, it, it will be a big part. And it's not a shift in direction. It's, uh, it's just one extra element to add in. I mean, you know, such as the mythology segment that we put into issue two, which, you know, it was just one more thing to, to add into the mix. And of course yeah. most mythologies have an element of truth, right? There, yeah, there may be some truth in the Sunna origin myth. Uh, I, I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> and of course it'd be no fun if we knew the answers to that, you know, how is it going to end? But yes, you, you will find out eventually. I mean, I have, I know what the ending is going to be. I have the ending mapped out. I know what the last story of Wasteland will be. And it will reveal the big secret. It will reveal exactly what happened. But obviously, that's a ways down the line yet. And until that point, I'm afraid you're only going to get clues. Now, uh, the reception to the first issue seems to be pretty good. And, you know, there are even quite a few people comparing it to The Walking Dead. How do you take those sort of comparisons? To be honest, I take it as a compliment. Um, if if we can sell even half of what The Walking Dead does every month, I'll be a very, very happy man. No, I, I, do, <laughs> I do take it as a big compliment because The Walking Dead is a massive, you know, a big critical hit. And one of the, one of the reasons that Walking Dead has been such a hit is its crossover between the indie and the mainstream crowd. Uh, and that is something that we, we seem to be doing with Wasteland as well. I have heard from a lot of people who don't normally read indie books, or perhaps The Walking Dead is the only other indie, the only indie book they do read, who have picked up Wasteland and decided that actually they like this book, it, it connects to them in some way. And obviously that, you know, that pleases me greatly. Now you've mentioned that the sales are doing well with the first issue. How good is the book selling? They're doing very well. Um, I mean, the, the first issue was certainly the highest ordered issue that I've ever had. Um, uh, and it was one of Ernie's highest for the year. I think, I think local 
issue one may have been the only thing in the last year that stiggied higher with full owning. So obviously that was fantastic. How successful do you think your marketing efforts were? You know, especially offering the first half of the first issue on BitTorrent. That was a pretty novel marketing tool. And yeah, the BitTorrent, the BitTorrent download was amazing. You know, given that, uh, that we're an indie book from an indie company, you know, Chris and I are hardly household names. And yet people were downloading it. Uh, a lot of people, simply because they were glad to see somebody supporting BitTorrent in that way, you know, endorsing it, if you like, and saying, actually, this is a valid method of distributing content. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would do that again in a heartbeat. And in fact, I think, um, actually, I'm not sure who, but I'm, I know, I remember that somebody else in the Oni stable said, I'm going to do that for my number one now as well. Because, it, it, yeah, it really did work so well. Yeah, you're a trailblazer. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say trailblazer so much as just desperate to get the word out in any possible way that I could. <laughs> Anthony, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. No, me, me too. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Good night. So I'd like to thank Anthony for taking some time to be our guinea pig and help us figure out exactly how to do a video interview from thousands of miles away. He was a good sport, and like I've said before, Wasteland is a great book, so if you're not reading it yet, what are you waiting for? Uh, now, our interview went on a little longer than you know what we got to show you here, so if you'd like to see some more, check it out on our website. I should have it up in a couple of days. Wow, that was a great interview. Absolutely. Definitely different, you know, the whole webcam feel to it and stuff. Um, it's odd. CNN-like. Uh, <sighs> you know, on another note, any artist anyone involved in comics that wants to you know have an interview with us get in contact with us you know we'll so like if you live in antarctica and you have a uh, you know a computer with a with a with a camera you can just you know talk to us about it that's a webcam that's yeah, a webcam right yep. there uh-huh um yeah you know like kevin's into the whole webcamming thing so uh you could definitely uh hit him up on that but that's it guys we have baltimore this week coming up a so lot. no discussion this week. It's a smaller episode, lack of discussion, because after uh, after Baltimore and the Harvey Conventions, Harvey Awards and Baltimore Convention, uh, I can only imagine the gigantic discussion that we'll be having down the road. But right now, I think we're just going to call it a... Call it... Call it even? Call it a thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Mike has to get to his crack rehabi rehabilitation center for his work. I don't have a problem. All right? I just, you know... I'm, I'm dealing with it. He's dealing with it, so well, that's how you deal with these things. And he's going to work on that. First step is admitting I have a problem. And he's not doing that. So first step, I guess, is a big one. Anyway, Baltimore coming up. A lot to get to. We're going to have a ton of interviews. We're going to have a ton of footage. Um, me drunk, Nick drunk. We're alcoholics here at Varian Edition. Me so um, cracked out on the street. Crack. Al well, you have to admit the problem first and then. That's not a problem. It's, I can I can handle it. That's okay. cool. Anyway, so we have a lot of stuff coming out to you guys, a ton of interviews and everything, so be on the lookout. Hit up our MySpace. Hit up our website. Always stuff going on there, bonus reviews, uh, YouTubes, the whole thing. So hit us up on there. Add us as a friend. And uh, that's it. That's the end of the show. Next week, drugs. Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore. So be on the lookout. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye, and don't do drugs.